Yes, hello everyone. I am Jake Taylor or Ferris, I guess. Um, yeah, so this is going to be a presentation on uh, my synth called Wavesaber. Um, it's, uh, well, I think it's pretty neat. Well, let me get uh, my stuff on screen. So, yes. Wavesaber is a, or well, who am I first? I'm Jake Taylor or Ferris, of course. I'm a real-time graphics engineer at Outtrax Technologies, so what I do is render programming, so I make graphics with code for a living. I'm 21 years old, um, but none of this matters, so on to synthy things. So what is a 64K synth exactly? Wavesaber is, which is, again, my synth, is, uh, it's unlike a lot of other synths that a lot of musicians use in that it's meant for making music for intro competitions like the one we have here. So in an intro competition, specifically 64K intros, the entire demo that you make uh, must fit into a single executable, and it must be within 64 kilobytes of, uh, of size. And uh, so to do music for those, you need specialized synths and specialized music systems to, yeah, to be able to squeeze music into that small of a space. So they, they're also used in executable music compos, which unfortunately the one here was canceled because they didn't have enough entries. But uh, I will be go, going over the entry that I had prepared for that because it uh, shows off the synth in good enough detail. Um, 64K synths by now uh, sound pretty good. I have some sound examples from intros. So this is a clip from Uncovering Static by Fairlight Nocturaz. We have... Uh, So that's the first example. This is Chaos Theory by Conspiracy. And this one has, uh, this one's particularly good. There's that one. And the last one I'm going to show is uh, from one of my group's intros. This is a song that I did uh, with the same synth that the previous one used uh, before I had made my own. This, this is what this sounds like.
So yeah, these synths are incredibly small. The music for this one in particular was only 16 kilobytes in size after everything was all said and done. So that includes code to generate the music and also the music data itself. Um, I'll get a little more into more of what that means. So yeah, they sound pretty good. So there are a few that are available. Uh, one is V2 by the group Farbrouch, which has been around for 11, 10, 11 years now. Um, there's Gargive Conspiracy has one. There's a bunch of guys that have made their own. But um, I wanted to do my own for, well, a few reasons. One is that I've just, I've wanted to for a very long time. I've done a bunch of uh, since for the 4K size limit, where basically your limit is around uh, one and a half K for the sound and, and music and everything. But um, I wanted to expand it and make something that sounded better in the bigger space. Um, I also like making and using my own tools. I find it uh, <laughs> cool. Um, and there are simple techniques in sound design that weren't available in existing since, or I mean, that you have in things like Massive or FM8, like in high-end music that I really wanted to see in intros. Um, so I thought that I should just implement those. Um, another thing is that a lot of these other synths are made to be extremely general purpose, and I didn't really care for that as much. I just wanted to make the music I thought was cool. So in this case, basically bass music, um, just because that's what I'm into these days. And finally, I just wanted to do one because I can, and I think that's a good enough reason to do anything. So why do a case study in my synth as opposed to maybe a general one, one on 64K synths? And the reason is because it's not really a science. There are a bunch of people who have made these before, but it's not, it's not a, a, a wide thing that a lot of people do. It's hard to find information on the internet, for instance, on how to do these. Um, another one is my system is fundamentally different than most other systems. Um, and I'll get into that later. Um, it's not necessarily complicated, but there are a lot of little pieces to go over. And I thought if I made this too general, then I wouldn't be able to focus on the details in mine. So why should you care about any of this? I have no idea. That's not my problem. So let's continue. Terminology. So Wave Saber, again, is my synth. I just want to go over this just to, just to clarify a few things. 64K synth is actually a little bit of an ambiguous term. It usually means the whole sound system to make music in a 64K. Um, but it could also be part of the system dealing with sound generation. If, if you, any of you guys have worked with music at all, you know what a synth is. It's the one that makes the music, makes the sound. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, so that can mean both. You also have a uh, channel or track, which is like a stream of audio. So when you, play, when you play notes through a synth, that goes on a channel, and then you can mix channels and things like that. Again, if you do music, this is very, very basic. An oscillator is the original source of an audio signal. Um, I can't really explain too much of this right now because, again, I have a lot more details to, to go over. Um, a device uh, in my synth world, and why you need to know this because I'll be referring to this a lot, is a signal processor or source. If you've ever used something like Ableton Live or Reason, you have, like, in, especially Reason's a good uh, parallel because you have rack devices, um, and those are basically the same thing as what a device is in my synth. Uh, another good uh, parallel is a VST. Um, a sample is also somewhat ambiguous. Um, it's normally the elementary unit of an audio signal. And what I mean by that is you have audios, and those are essentially arrays of, of data. And each slot in that array is actually where your speaker is over time. And that's, that position is called a sample. So I will use it, I will refer to samples more as that than the other meaning, which is. Uh, which is actually um, like, a, like a clip of audio that's been recorded, such as a drum uh, might be a sample. So a uh, buffer is a storage transmission medium for an audio signal. Again, I can't, uh, I can't explain that too much, but it's just think of it as an array of samples. So I want to go through the life of a Wave Saber song. Um, actually, first, I would really like to, uh, to play a song that's actually been produced in this so you know a little bit more of what I'm talking about. So this, this was going to be the executable music entry that's, that I had prepared, but, um, well, yeah, com combo got canceled, things happen.
you guys get the idea. But um, yeah, so this this is a song written in my synth, and um, this, when all said is done, is 29 kilobytes. Uh, without the Invader Zim sample, it's around 21, I think, which is more or less your target range for this kind of thing. So it's very, very small. Um, to put that in comparison, if you download Massive, which is a, a single VST, that's around 200 megabytes, I believe, which is thousands and thousands of times bigger than this entire song. So that's fun. So yeah. Get to this. The life of a Wavesaber song. So first, there's three different parts of producing music for 64K. You have the actual production, which is where you, or there's production, conversion, synthesis. So in production, you produce the song in some kind of tool. And that's, any musician is already doing this with their own tools. So you're just making a song. Um, in the case of Wavesaber, the song is produced in one of two DAWs, which is Live or Reaper. Um, moving over to just live as versions of Reaper become more and more incompatible with stuff I wrote. Um, there are also very few limitations actually imposed on the composer, and I'll get, to, I'll get to that. The next step you have is conversion. So you need, at some point, once you've made your song in your, in your, uh, in your tool, you need to get it to the EXE somehow. And so the way I do that is to I parse the project file. So you save like the live project, and I bring that in. I look at all the data inside, and then I produce something else. So my converter is uh, it's very basic, but it does a lot of work. And uh, I'll get into more of that as well. Um, and then the final part you have is the synthesis. And this is the actual playing of the song once it's in the executable. You can't just store um, the actual wave data. You have to resynthesize the song. And that's why it's so small. So you take, uh, you basically break the song down into a tree of structures, and then you serialize that, and then you break that apart again, and then play. Again, I'll get into more details here. So let's look at each. So the first one we have are the production tools. So when when designing a synth, you can basically go two main routes, and that's one you can make an entire tool yourself. Um, I tried this and failed uh, in 2011. Brutally, I tried to make something like Reason, but uh, I do not have the patience to do that kind of UI. Um, it takes ages, and it's just not fun. Um, so the other way that you can do it is you can do one or more plugins. Uh, one of the awesome things about music production these days is it's almost entirely plugin-based. Um, so you <coughs> you have a tool called a DAW, which is Digital Audio Workstation, and in your DAW you bring in different, uh, different plugins. And so one might make sound, one might filter sound. And you're able to just use, use a ton of different software with your main tool. And that's really awesome. So I think the plugin approach is really good for this and it's very smart. It also saves a ton of design work, both uh, in the front end and the back, because now you no longer have to do a UI for your tool, which is quite awesome. And uh, the other thing is that a lot of your back end can be redesigned with how the tool works. Instead of thinking how oh how should track word how should track work or track routing work how should tracks go together and how should the mixer work and how should all this feel you don't have to worry about any of that because you just emulate how the tool works and that's uh, much smarter. So let's talk about plugins then because obviously that's what I, that's what I did. So there's two two kinds of routes when you get into plugins. You either have the monolithic VST. Uh, monolithic in this case is just one big unit. So there are other synths like V2, which I thought about showing, but it would take too much time. But essentially, the whole thing is in one plugin, which means in your tool, you have to do a lot of hacky stuff to say, OK, these notes go to this channel, and these notes go to this channel, and so, so on and so forth. And it's very annoying. But most 64K synths work this way because it allows them to be entirely DAW independent, which means you can open it up in any DAW produced in any tool you want and still get music out of it. And that's quite useful. But it's very annoying. It's very tedious from a developer perspective to add and remove new features. And that's something I really wanted to avoid. And all in all, I just hate this. I hate big monolithic things in general. So I wanted to do something else. So I made a modular system. Um, that means I implement, instead of one big synth, I implement it as a bunch of small VSTs. And this is, this is very nice, because musicians are used to working this way. They pull in plugins from all over the place and just use those and then produce their music which is much better than, than having one that you manage all the time that you're tweaking, and that's very annoying. Um, a downside to this is with the monolithic VST approach, everything is built into your synth, including how tracks are routed and things like that, um, which means you have all that information already in the tool. 
But with the VSTs, you only have VSTs basically work where the, the DAW tells them to play notes or, tell, or gives them audio sources that they have to filter and output. So it's, uh, you, you lose a lot of information while you're running in the tool. So I have to get that back somehow. And the way I do that is to convert the project file, as I said earlier. And that's the main reason I do that, is that way I can see, OK, this track goes to this track, this track goes to this track. The, the plugins are arranged in this order, and so on and so forth. So that's, that's very nice. However, that locks the system into very few DAWs. Again, like I said, I use uh, Live and Reaper. Um, and the reason is because they have human readable project formats where I can, I can actually look at them in text. And I, they're, the formats themselves are not documented, so I have to go in and put a note here and then look at what changed in the file and back and forth, back and forth. It's very tedious, so I'm not going to do that with binary files. I'm going to do that with text files. So that's why I do that. <coughs> now, I have one other advantage um, when I design the system, too. And that's that I'm actually the musician that's going to, be, going to be using this most of the time. And that's really nice, because then I can cater to my own needs, like, like this, where I want to have a very modular system and only support a few DAWs that I will actually use. So that's quite nice. Um, the other thing about this modular system is it's very, it makes it very easy to add and remove pieces. If I decide in a couple months that I don't like one of the synths I've made, I can just trash it and put in another one, and the rest of my system still works. And this, is, this, will be, this will be very good when I get sick of dubstep, because then I can start making other styles of music and build synths specifically to those. So that's very useful. Uh, and yeah, I do not hate this approach. This, is, this works quite well. Um, so for some tool design, um, yes. This, this is where I'm going to start getting a little technical for, for you coders, because it's, it's actually really important to understand my thought process behind how I coded things to understand why this is small and why my system works so well. So <clears throat> being as my system was modular, I wanted to use as many existing software layers as possible. And that means, first of all, I will do my system in a bunch of little layers, and I will, I will go over that more in detail. But also, I want to use as many, I want to pull in as many third-party pieces that are already finished as possible. I also said I hate doing UIs, because that's terrible. So I use the, I implement my, uh, my Synthes VST plugins specifically. And that's because the VST SDK is very easy to use. You just download a bunch of C++ stuff, and you're ready to go. Um, on top of that, it comes with something called VST GUI, which allows you to do very simple but effective enough. Yeah, <laughs> Sessa over here hates it. Um, but it allows you to do simple enough GUIs and more complicated, or more complicated than just the default sliders that you get if you don't do one at all. So it's uh, worth using there. I even use uh, ripped graphics in my synth. Uh, you'll notice all the knobs are from oh, FM8. I will wait a second. <laughs> yes. So, um, <coughs> where was I? Yes. Yeah, so the knobs in my synth are even ripped from FM8, so I just, I thought they looked cool. Um, but yeah, I wanted to make my system as modular as possible. Again, it's very important for me to be able to add new, add new synths, add new effects whenever I need. Um, that has to be supported. Um, so I designed it as a lot of different thin layers of software. Another really important thing that I actually failed with with some of my 4K synths is in my 4K synths, I would have different audio processing code in the tool and in the player. So in the tool, it was written in C, and I was able to, to process the audio one way. But then when I ported it to Assembler, I lost some semantics somewhere. And I didn't know what I was doing enough to realize where what I had actually lost, but it ends up sounding a little bit different. It just has different character, a bit snappier in a bad way. It's just not good. I wanted the same audio code in the tool and the player, one because it sounds the same, and the other one is because of maintenance. If I want to change something, I change it in one place. So yeah, again, more gory details. So this is the main software stack. And this is, uh, this is it's very simple, but it's, but it's actually really important. So at the lowest level, I have what I call WaveSaber Core. WaveSaber Core is a software module that contains all the actual audio processors. So I, I can show you, pull up in Visual Studio here. WaveSaber Core. WaveSaber Core contains um, all the devices. And I will go over what some of these actually are, too. Um, but it also contains a lot of useful bits and pieces that the devices might use, such as a certain kind of filter or an envelope 
or different kinds of helpers to convert values to different, different ranges and things like that. It's very useful to have uh, all this in a common place. So yeah, that's what WaveSaber Core is. Then I have WaveSaber Player Lib, which uh, builds a player on top of the core modules. And then the intro or the player or whatever you want, uh, we'll use that to actually play the music. On the other end, we have the WaveSaber VST lib. Oops. And that's, uh, that's a simple layer between the core processor and the VST SDK. So that kind of ties those together and makes sort of a base system that you can make VSTs out of. Then the plugins sit on top of that. So the plugins will use this, this VST library to just implement very simple VST interface to the processor. So it's very, very layered and very module, or modular. So yes. <coughs> is, is, there, is there a key shortcut, by the way, to just jump into a, to a slide? That'd be quite useful. OK. Anyway, the converter. So one, once, you, once you've made your tool, and you ha or once you've made your song and you have your project file, you have to convert it. So again, the main idea is you bring in an ALS or an RPP. Those are song, f song formats for Live or Reaper in one end, and you get a C++ header in the other. So I wanted this to be designed as a command line tool. I was going to do it in C Sharp and no other language, because C Sharp is the best language in the world. Um, I was going to do as much work here as possible. Things like um, one of the things that when you're doing music uh, and you have track routing, I can show you this in live. If you, if you have, let's say, if you watched uh, Monus' seminar about routing an organization, um, then you'll, you'll know what busing is. But essentially, I have all these different sounds, and these are bass sounds. And they go into this one channel, which is, brings all the bass together so I can further process them together. Now, this, this actually gives us a problem to solve when we're converting, because now we, we need to know, based on this list of tracks and which ones feed into each other, we have to figure out which tracks need to be processed before the other ones, because you can't process this before you process this, for instance, or else it just wouldn't work. You need all these as input before you can process this. So you do need, a, you do need to write a small algorithm to find the actual order that all these will be processed in. So I do that in the converter. Because we know that when the song's playing, that will never change. It's different in the tool because I could sit here and route this to a different one instead, and that's fine. But that will never happen when I'm playing the music in the intro. So I'm able to make those kind of assumptions and take care of that in the converter. Um, I can also remove unreachable sections of the device graph, and that's a fancy wording for I can, I can see, OK, well, if this is muted, I can just leave it out as, I, as I'm converting, and that's, that's quite nice. Um, I can remove disabled plugins as well. So I can go on here, and uh, let's say I have all this processing for whatever this is. And uh, if I decide to not have one of these modules, then that's OK. Then I can still have this in my project file, which is important when I'm working with it, in case I want to put it back in later. But in the actual intro, this will never get there because it's turned off. <coughs> um, the other thing is, when it finds a plugin it doesn't recognize, it will just skip it instead of throwing up. A lot of things crash with simple cases like this. And it sounds like a really simple, simple idea that you should just ignore this kind of thing. But it's extremely useful, because uh, on my master, I always have this. And this, what this is is uh, it's a monitor, basically. So as I'm playing music, I can, see, I can see what's going on. But of course, this is not one of my plugins. This is, just, this is some commercial VST. And I want to always have this on here, instead of taking it out every time to convert my song. So I just skip, skip ones that it doesn't recognize. And that's quite nice. Data flow in the converter is quite simple. Take in a project file. Then it will either go to a Reaper parser or a Live parser, because they're different formats. Those go to a Reaper structure or a Live structure. And then those will be converted into a single song structure, which then gets dumped out to a header and played. Um, I apologize for going a little bit fast through this, but there, there is a lot of information here. And finally, the synthesis. Now, I tried to, to get slides here and try to do something more structured, but I realized that I just kind of have to show you my, more of the synth at this point. So I, I, kinda, I think the best thing to do is actually to go over different kinds of synthesis that I actually use, which I'm sure a lot of you guys are most interested in anyway. So let's just grab, let's just find a sound that I like. I think, I think this one was cool. I like that sound. So let's actually go over how this is made. So 
this, now we'll kind of I kind of introduce you to some of the devices. Um, I won't go over all of them, just the ones we need here. So we have on this device chain we have Falcon. Falcon is one of my devices that is an FM synthesizer, and um, FM synthesis is one of those things that like uh, Skrillex and Kill the Noise use for their growls. So I wanted to try if I could squeeze this into my synth. Um, I ended up being able to, but it's a very simplified version of FM8. FM8 is extremely, extremely complex, and that's the FM8. By the way, is the the big synth that the big guys use that does FM synthesis. But FM8 is is its own beast, and I could spend hours talking about that. But instead, I took a small subset of that and implemented it here. Um, you can you can I won't go over exactly what FM synthesis is, but you just now you know that I have it. Um, so essentially, I can actually pull up FM8 and show you uh, the configuration that I've copied here, because I think that's actually somewhat interesting. I mean, throw up a track here. Yes, this is FM8. Most of this stuff isn't important, but this is the configuration I've made. Now it's probably very confusing to know what this is, but each of these is essentially an oscillator that makes sound. And what, what this graph is saying is that you have two oscillators. One of them <coughs> can either feed into the other one or to itself. The other one can feed to itself and to the output. So you hear the output from this one, but this one modulates itself and that. And so this kind of makes, well, strange sounds. Let's see if I can even get anything. Audible out of this. Bring over a little bit of how this stuff works. Doesn't seem to be getting anything, but uh, anyway, the point is that this is a very simple FMA configuration, and instead of trying to tweak FM synthesis for my tool the way that, or to try and make my own thing, I went the smarter route and actually took this and went and spent a couple hours and and coded this configuration by hand and then spent a couple hours tweaking where I would make it here, change the values, and look at the output. Because if I have that meter that I brought up earlier, if I can grab that, in one of these settings, you can actually see, well, you can't because this isn't routed correctly. But anyway, when, when you play the audio, you can actually see the waveform. And that's very useful. So what I actually did is make my synth this Falcon unit match FM8 perfectly, like to as much as I possibly could from that visual representation. So that was very useful because, uh, well, because then I spent way less time tweaking. So yeah, that's what that does. Here you have the first oscillator and the second one, and blah 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 blah. It'd be a bit too much time to explain all of that. And then I have Scissor. Scissor is my favorite device in WaveSaber, and I will, I will tell you that because I use it on everything, and I now also use it in my other music. Uh, I did music for a demo in the demo compo that you will hear this in uh, quite a lot, actually. I believe this also made it into Magnus's track for the freestyle music, so it's, uh, it's quite good. But what this is, this is a distortion unit, and this is, uh, it's actually extremely, extremely simple, but it's also a ripoff from Native Instruments. So uh, Native Instruments has a synth called Razor, and Razor is an additive synth. And it doesn't, that's not really the important part, but the important part is that at the end of the chain in Razor, you have what's called a hard clipper. And hard clipping is one of the simplest things you can do in audio. It's literally just when the sound peaks, you just cut it off. And it really makes nasty, nasty distortion. But if that's what you want, then it's great. I can actually show you a, a picture here where I made it. Uh, Perfect. Or, ah well, maybe take take too long to find it. But essentially, yeah, what I'm doing is just clipping the signal. I also have a couple other wave shaping algorithms uh, that this will decide, but it's uh, yeah, they're a bit uh, sketchy, so I won't won't go into those. But then another very important instrument uh, or device here is leveler. Leveler is a three band EQ plus low and high pass. So. You audio guys will know what that means, but I can I can actually recreate it in uh, in uh, with this stuff. <coughs> yeah. So this is the live EQ. 
or EQ8. So if I do this, this is this is basically what uh, what leveler is, and actually, it's not because this is. Is it this one? I think it is. Five goes up. Yes. Okay. So here we have the first the first band, which is or first we have the low cut, so this will high pass the signal. Then we have the high cut at the end, which will low pass the signal. And this is useful, one, for actually doing the job of EQing. EQ is extremely important in getting actually good sounds out of a synth. Uh, most synths skip this, and I hate them for it, because I use EQ religiously. Um, five or six times even on, on some instruments between different plugins to, to tweak sounds, so it's very important. But then, of course, you have three peak filters as well. And peak filters will do this to your sound, so you can go through different parts of the spectrum and tweak tweak how all these, how all different parts sound. Um, this is very useful. So you have these, basically these same controls uh, in my, in my leveler plugin here. So you have low, high, and then the three, three peaks. Very, 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 very useful. The other one that I'm using on this instrument is uh, Smasher, which is a uh, compressor. This compressor is also very important. One, for doing what a compressor is supposed to do, and more importantly, for doing sidechain compression with drums. So as I play this, I don't know if you can actually tell right now because the routing, I think I have to do it through here for you to hear it. But you can hear when I play it, it the sound ducks instead of just playing solid, which it does when I play it on its own. And that's actually really important for me to to be able to do that. Uh, it's very important for to make good bass music to be able to get your drums to punch through the mix. So it was very important that I had that. So those are a couple, uh, couple devices. Um, yes. Now, yeah. So I went through the software stack, and what happens is these devices all get, all are stored in that product file. And when it's converted, then I have these same devices in the player. So what's actually happening then is I have all this note data that then gets pumped through these synths. So normally in the DAW, that's actually done by the DAW, and it just gives your synth notes. But then I just have to create, for the synthesis, when I replay this, I just have to create this sort of routing tree again, and then just do this, this kind of stuff myself. It's a bit, uh, a bit tough to explain, but I think, uh, I think you guys seem to be following. Um, so I'm actually going to go through final words so I can get to Q&A. So final words, I'm going to say that this was extremely fun to make. Um, I really like coding size optimized things. Uh, it's really, really fun. Uh, I love the sound. Um, it's a system designed to last. And there are still bugs, but there are very minor ones. So I'm pretty happy with it. So if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to open the floor. Otherwise, I can keep talking, because I can talk about this for hours. <laughs> yep. Sessa, do we have a mic? <coughs> Uh, one, two, three. Is it uh, on? Is it on? Sound, low, sound, low, sound. low. I oh, yes, I am on. Yes. What is your strategy for anti-aliasing? For anti-aliasing, yes. I saw the anti-aliasing uh, problem in the oscillators. So I have two main synths that I use. I went over that one that was called Falcon. And Falcon is the, uh, the FM synthesizer. And I actually didn't do any anti-aliasing on that one. And the reason I didn't is because FM8 didn't. The uh, FM synthesis by nature will alias. Uh, unless you have some really expensive, is it IIR filter at the end, which will can cut it off. But it is very, very tricky for FM. Yeah. Uh, so but you will also have aliasing in your distortion, right? And in some nonlinear filters. Yes. And, and in those, I kept, I didn't anti-alias at all. Because um, like the hard clipping itself, the aliasing is actually something I want to hear. I like the sound. So I left it in there on purpose. Um, so as far as anti-aliasing in the whole picture, it only really exists in one place, and that's in the slaughter device, which is a, uh, this is meant to be essentially my massive replacement. So this is just a very basic subtractive synth with three oscillators and a noise generator. You also have a filter with envelopes uh, and a pitch envelope and some other voicing parameters. Um, this one is, 
this is the result of what you probably know what uh, BLEP, synthesis is, BLEP synthesis is, where you have the band limited impulse train and you integrate that. So I do that without actually band limiting the impulses. And so it sort of works. Um, it doesn't really, though. Uh, but I'm able to hide it in the music. So that's something that I think I will need to address, actually, because. Uh, you do start hearing it, especially when you sweep through notes. You get the yo 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 stuff that's not the cool stuff, but the <laughs> the really annoying high pitch stuff. So it only exists in these oscillators, but yeah. But that's my answer for the anti-aliasing thing. Are there any other questions? Magnus. Hi, Jake. Hi. Uh, I was wondering. Um, could you show us how it would work with the scissor on the master channel with Shope? Yeah. How to kind of master yeah, this, it. This is, this is quite cool. Uh, we are, I was producing the track uh, that will be the track in the, the intro that I'm releasing. Um, and we're trying to get uh, maximum loudness. I'll actually pull that up. Original here. We're trying to get mass, maximum uh, loudness. And Magnus had a brilliant idea to abuse one of the plugins to make things louder, um, which is uh, quite nice. Takes a while to load. It's a bit large. There we are. Yes. Uh, the <laughs> lovely screen real estate here. But yeah. So on the actually pre-master, this is all the stuff I'm doing in my demo track as the final processing pass. So this would be mastering in my 64K synth. So with all of these turned off, I can play you a small clip, but I won't play much. Um, yeah, I can, I'll play you this chunk here. This is without mastering. And it sounds OK, but uh, lacks a lot of beef. So with all of this on, now we have good sound. Um, so what Manus's question was, was how can you use scissor, which is my distortion unit, on the master to help, uh, to help beef things up? And also, what does that look like in the meter? And I will show you that now, because it's quite cool. So scissor, again, is my distortion unit. And in this case, I think, actually, that might have just been a clipper one. Let me go here, here. So this, this, this sound actually doesn't have that much headroom already, because it's already been a little compressed and already been a bit beefed up. Um, yes. So we want to squeeze a little more loudness out of this. And Magnus's idea, and this was kind of funny, was to just stick, stick the hard clipper on there and just pump that up a little bit. So as you can see, the sound is actually clipping a tiny bit. And I can show you without. You have this. And as you start bringing this up, you reach, you approach clipping range. And it will just get hard clipped at, at the top, which will introduce aliasing. But it's very minute, and you hear the loudness more than anything. You can actually. You can actually get away with this here. And that's uh, the cool thing is that now I have essentially a limiter, which is a really important tool in mastering. But it's actually just a hard clipper. Now that works quite well. Yes. So that's what that looks like. So yeah, uh, any other questions? Yeah, uh, one, one, a couple of things that I forgot to mention that I actually feel like are really important that I'll just sort of close with are, one, um, no, I did not write this in assembly or C or anything crazy. I wrote this in C++11. And the reason why is because if you use proper object-oriented programming, you will get small code. All of my 64Ks are written that way as well. And I have never been above 40K on any of them, including the big one that I'm doing now. Um, so just so you know, that's the good way to do it. Uh, you, you, it is probably possible to re rewrite the whole thing in C or whatever, but I will absolutely never do that, because uh, the modularity in my software is quite nice. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Uh, the other thing that I want to say is if you guys have any more questions or you want to see any more of this on the code or 
or, or the music or anything, or if you want tips or any of that, if you want to make your own or want help or whatever, you can find me in the Creative Lounge. I'll be very, very, very busy till about 5, 5.30 tonight working on my production. But other than that, catch me anytime, and I'd be happy to talk about this stuff. So thank you guys very much. Uh, yeah.